description in the uh, comments box that will help you better engage with us. But for those who's watching on YouTube, thank you guys so much for watching. We greatly appreciate you guys rocking with me since the early days of 2008, now whenever this YouTube channel started. So we greatly appreciate the old and the new subscribers. So we thank you. Also for those who's watching or per se uh, listening on uh, Google Play as well as Apple Podcasts. So thank you guys for listening. Please subscribe, rate us, all of you guys, wherever you're listening or watching. Please go into the description boxes right now. There's some links for you to engage with us. You can give, you can donate, you can also go to our learning community where you can be able to find our course, How to Overcome Procrastination. And within the next 30 or 40 days or so, we'll be coming out with a new course for you guys to partake in. So feel free to engage, feel free to share. We greatly appreciate you guys' support. But for those in the room, turn me your Bibles to Philippians 2, 12 through 18, as well as Philippians 3, 12 through 16. <coughs> Philippians 2, 12 through 18. And we're also going to be reading Philippians 3, 12 through 16. The Bible reads, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or dis disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Among, oh, that's it. Philippians 3, 12 through 16. The Bible reads, Now that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining or pressing forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have obtained. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. We greatly appreciate your support and your love. Thank you, Father God, for graciously giving us the opportunity to engage with you. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us the opportunity through salvation to be able to work out our salvation, to be able to grow in it, to thrive in it, Father God. And through this sanctification process, we give you the gr glory and the honor of giving us the opportunity to be better versions of ourselves with the intent of ensuring that you get the glory. With that being said, God, we thank you, Lord, that you will be with us today, speaking through me today. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your presence, for without it, God, it will be, we'll be wasting our time. So God, we thank you. And we cherish you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Let's get right into our first point, And then we're going to go through some very important notes that will help us better understand what it means to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. Point number one. The Holy Spirit is our trainer. And the gym he trains us in is called Salvation Fitness. The owner of this gym is Jesus. And this gym franchise was passed down by God the Father. The Holy Spirit is our trainer. And the gym he trains us in is called Salvation Fitness. I'm going somewhere with it. I know y'all laughing and chuckling, but we're going somewhere. The owner of this gym is Jesus, and the gym franchise was passed down by God the Father. I'll repeat it one more time. The Holy Spirit is our trainer, and the gym he trains us in is called Salvation Fitness. The owner of this gym is Jesus, and this gym franchise was passed down by God the Father. Many, 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 many years ago, there was a place, a perfect place, a place where perfect people and a perfect God dwelt amongst each other. In this place, these individuals, Adam and Eve, for all of us, we all know that, they had a place where they were perfect, they were conditioned, they were in shape. In this facility, if you will, in this, in this atmosphere, they had access to all types of machinery, access to all types of, of, of nutrients. They had access to everything, and everything was for their grasp. But these two people didn't appreciate the grace that God had gave them, didn't appreciate the opportunity that they had. That in this moment, this moment, this, 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 this opportunity, this place that was perfect was tainted. It was destroyed because two people took it for granted. That's why I tell people, do not take God for granted. And after that moment, you can almost imagine 
that these two people were removed because they broke the membership contract. They broke the, the agreement. They, they, they broke the number one rule that they wasn't supposed to break and they broke the covenant. And from that moment as they broke the covenant, this, this place called Eden Fitness, this place where they were perfect, this place where they had opportunity, this place where they had access, this thing was closed to further notice. On the outside of this place was that there will be one day that this atmosphere, this opportunity will be open for mankind. As man began to progress and as womankind and mankind and civilization began to increase, every now and then you heard about the Spirit of God coming upon man, that, that this trainer, the precious Spirit of God, came upon man to condition them for a specific task. And as time continued to progress, the co-founder, Jesus, came on the scene. What was once closed was now having its inaugural introduction that when Jesus came on the scene, the co-founder of this, this opportunity, this, the co-founder of the moment, the grace that God's given us through salvation, this co-founder began to live a life that even at 12 years old, this individual, 100% God and 100% man, this individual, even at 12, told his family that I'm about my father's business. A business that was closed, a business that was separated, a business that was removed. He was now about his father's business. And from 12 to 30, this individual was unknown. Nobody knew what he was doing. He was a son of a carpenter. He was, a, he was in an atmosphere where he came from richness and, and, and prosperity and came through poverty. This individual said, I'm going to open what was once closed. This Jesus, the co-founder. That the individual who gives us this opportunity was now from the wilderness and, and from the, his Galilee and, and in Jerusalem, the palm branches as we celebrate in this week was laid out because the king of all kings was coming and making his introduction. But many people thought that he was going to reign on earth, but failed to realize that he was being brought to his death. But at his death, beaten in his face and beard ripped and and beating 39 lashes, that one removed, meaning that he was, if he was whipped 40, on the 40th time, he wouldn't have survived. That when he was nailed to that cross and, and when he gave up that ghost, at that moment when he gave up the ghost, the veil, which was yards deep, this veil couldn't have been ripped by man. This veil was so deep that to the point where only God can rip it, I call this the ribbon cutting ceremony. That when that ribbon, that veil was ripped, we now have access to be engaged in a salvation that requires us to work in it. The veil, the ribbon cutting ceremony, the, the moment in time where now what God had for man, man now can come boldly and say, you know what, God, I no longer have to rest in my past. I no longer have to worry about what I went through. I now can press forward. I can now press after the mark of the high calling. I can now work out this experience, this salvation. And now the trainer, who is also a co-founder for they all three in one, are now working together for us to work out our salvation so that we can be the best that we can be in right now. Outside of Samsung's virtual reality, now we have a supernatural reality in where, by which that now the Holy Spirit works us out. He using everything that was meant for our evil. He's turned around for our good to those who love God and called according to his purpose. That everything that we see through the right lens as we can now see in a supernatural reality, the Holy Spirit, our trainer, working everything out for our good, giving us the atmosphere we need to work out this salvation with fear and trembling. This salvation fitness is, is, is a place where we all, those who are truly converted, have membership for, that this membership wasn't us finding some ad in a newspaper and decided to go to a gym and try to sign up. No, we didn't choose him, he chose us. And from that choice, I now have the opportunity to work out my salvation. Now, what does that mean? Point two. To walk out our salvation with fear and trembling means to walk out our salvation with reverence and dependency. To walk out our salvation with fear and trembling means to walk out our salvation with reverence and dependency. To walk out my salvation or our salvation with fear and trembling means to walk out our salvation 
with reverence and dependency. Many people looked at that text for many years and they thought that I have to work out my salvation and anxiety and, and fear and that, 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 that I can lose it per se, that, 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 I could, that if I'm not careful, this, this God will snatch my membership, that this God who, who in his omniscience foreknew who would accept him. And he's saying to us that this wasn't a, 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 a declaration by Paul for us to be afraid. This wasn't a declaration for us to walk out our salvation in fear and anxiety. It says that we can now walk out this salvation with reverence, and dependency. Next point, your level of respect will determine the length of your actions. And your level of dependency will determine your level of demonstration. Your level of respect will determine the length of your actions. And your level of dependency will determine your level of demonstration. Your level of respect will determine the length of your actions. And your level of dependency will determine your level of demonstration. It is my responsibility through this membership that I have, this covenant that I have with God, that all co-founders from the beginning of time, when they, when they first said, let us make man our image, and I like this, God being one in being three, expressed three ways, one in essence expressed three ways through time. This God said, I now am going to create what Eden was closed by. Now I can have salvation. I can have growth anywhere that we don't have to be compartmentalized into a, a building per se or a country per se. That now <clears throat> this trainer can come to your home and use your workplace, use your cookouts. Use your grocery store experiences, whether you're at Harvey's or Whole Foods, wherever you are, he can utilize any moment at any time for you to progress. When I work out my salvation with reverence, I'm saying, God, because of the cost, because of what it took because of what you did. I revere you. Most people are more afraid of God than they are in reverence of God. That they're more afraid of what God will and will not do, what God can and cannot do, that the only reason why they supposedly wrote their name on Christian anity was because it was afraid of hell fire. But when you're truly converted, you're not converted by fear, you're converted by love. For the Bible says it was the goodness of God that drew men and women to repentance. It wasn't the hellfire and brimstone to a degree can shake the soul, but it can't change the soul. Only the love of God, the, 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 the overbearing compassion, the grace that he gave us supernaturally, that when a person now has the right mindset and the right lens, they now can say, God, because of your love, I respect you. Right now, the number one person that you respect, they came in this room, your actions will be limited. Some of us will try to fix our, fix our face. We'll try to, man, I should have wore that shirt. I knew I should have wore a tie to unplug a day. Father God, you was telling me to wear a tie. I didn't know this person was going to come. Your level of respect <clears throat> will determine the length, lengths of your actions. Meaning, like I told the people in Miami, I said, my respect for women limits my actions towards women. The more respect I have for women, I won't, my actions will be limited. I won't hit a woman. I won't cheat on mines. I won't do certain things because of my level of respect. But when a person doesn't have respect, their actions are unlimited. Many of us have no respect for God, I can tell you why. By your fruit, by your actions. If you truly reverence God, not because you're trying to get perfect attendance or perfect score on your, on your uh, salvation into great testing. We're not saying that, but what I am saying is, God, you've been too good for me to do something that's gonna separate me from you. Because there's nothing on this planet that's good, -der, or good enough for me than you. I'm not perfect, but the perfect one is speaking. And if he wants to say gooder, I'm going to let him say gooder. All right, let's back to the text. And what I'm trying to say is, is that we got to get to a place where we say, you know what, God? I honor your office. We honor the police to some degree. We honor government officials. We honor people who hold the rights to what we desire. But it's so sad we don't honor God an ounce. If we did, 
we wouldn't be doing some of the things that we do. Is it because this gracious, loving, caring God hasn't struck half of us down yet? Is it because this loving God's integrity and his pursuit of us is holding back his wrath? Could it be that he's by his own integrity and his own omniscience is saying, I could, but I'm not because I'm patient and I'm gracious. Is that probably the reason why our actions are so unlimited? My level of reverence Honor that is the God of the universe. <clears throat> the Bible says, why fear man who can only kill the body? The Bible reads, you better fear the one that could put both body and soul in hell. It's so sad that we fear people more than we do the person that created them. And when you have a fear of God, you won't be afraid of no man. But if you have more fear in man, you will have no fear in God. And I tell people right now, we better switch that. Because I'd rather have God on my side and be encamped around people that meant me harm, knowing that I can be like, yo, Drew, Jacob, the rest of y'all, God, open their eyes and let them see that there's more with us than against us. And that's where we got to be in life, where we say, God, I'm not going to be more afraid of man than I am than you. Not as far as shaking in my boots, they say. But God, I know our covenant. I know you love me. I know you care for me. And God, if it's not my time to go, we're going to have another Elijah experience. We're going to have another Daniel experience because the same God that was the God of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the God of David, the God of the rest of them is the same God today. And the reason why probably God is not doing as many miracles as he did in the Old Testament without covenant is because many people have broke covenant. And many people saying, God, I'm not connected enough to you to cherish you. And when we find ourselves in that moment of temptation, of test, of fear, your weight of reverence in your heart towards God will determine what you would do. When pressured, what would you do today? When tested, what would you do? Do you have enough reverence and track record and faithfulness with God or trust and love him that no matter what moment you find yourself in, you can say, for God I live, for God I die. I honor him above all. My level of dependency determines my level of demonstration. The more dependent I am in God, the more I can demonstrate. The Bible says to walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. Trembling says I have an awareness that I'm nothing without him, that I depend on him, <clears throat> that in the salvation and sanctification process, I am dependent. I'm in connection. I can't do this on my own. And with that dependency, I know for a fact that if I need to engage in power, I'm connected. When you depend on God and you trust him and you know that you're just frail, incompetent without him, that you have in the, in the forefront of your mind that it's in him that we live, move and have our being. Then when tested, you will say, you know what? I know that I'm weak in you. And I love the scripture that says not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The spirit of God is always telling us, says, man, your might. In this world system, is not strong enough. Your might against an intricate worldview, a system's full of deceptions, your might cannot come against. But when you operate in the power of God and your dependency in prayer, your dependency <clears throat> at work, and wherever you are, I will demonstrate my power through you. When you're aware of just how frail, vulnerable you are, you'll stay dependent. The Bible says, they that stand, take heed lest they fall. I never stand. I'm always kneeling. Even in my heart is what I'm saying. I got to keep a humble statue. Because Josh didn't get here on his own. <laughs> God, through his GPS, guided me here. And yes, I made turns. He had to recalibrate. <clears throat> but I'm thankful that he still brought me here. And I've learned in my 31 some years, the more dependent on him I am, the more of his demonstrating power he does. And I'm telling people right now, if you want to see God move, be dependent. Being dependent is a mindset. It says, you know what, God, I don't know nothing. 
Even in my knowing, I know nothing. Father God, for your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. God, we got cliff notes with you. God, we're cheating with you. That's why it hurts me to see the world advancing beyond the Christian. Is it because the world at least have their information, their knowledge? They do have books and colleges, but we don't even go to the number one teacher of all time, the precious spirit of God. Imagine if you trained with him more often. Just imagine where you could be today if you every single morning went to training. Every morning said, God, train me in this day. Guide me in this day. Lead me in this day. Show me your will in this day. That before you even started your own agenda, looked at your phone, checked on people who don't care about your life. When you begin to check with the trainer, he'll say, you know, we're going to work on this today. He's going to look through his... I saw last week your love was kind of low. We're going to train this today. Going to do three sets of this today. Four sets of this today. Oh, your pride was kind of high. You know, I, you know, I'm a real trainer. I'm going to tell you the truth. Your pride was kind of high. So today we're going to work on. And so you're going to already know that when so and so comes on your job, you know, there's a testing experience. You know, for a fact that when resistance has come, that this is an opportunity for you to train. <clears throat> That's why it's so sad that many of us run away from resistance, but fail to realize it is actually the resistance that makes us stronger. And the trainer is saying, no, no, no. I know this is tough for you. I know you don't like this, but engage with this. This work uh, this co-worker engage with your mom now she's calling you because I had her call you engage with her right now you thought that the situation was meant to be your your detriment but it was meant to be for your advancement and when you allow him to be the trainer that he is and you depend on his work plan when you work out your salvation daily you will find yourself stronger and stronger and stronger could you be the real reason why thing why things are being delayed could you be the reason <clears throat> why things that you pray for is being delayed? God says, stop praying and start practicing. Stop asking and be about it. Stop being a hearer and start being a doer. And God said, do you even match what you're asking for? Do you even match what you pray for? Are you even it that you're asking for? That's why I tell people, silence your prayers and initiate your development and show God. That's why every time I go to God about Unplug, I almost write up a small three or four page paragraph a document of, of a business plan. I'm like, God, this is the reason why I want this. This is the reason why I would like this. This is the reason because God's going to either tell me, okay, that looks good. Okay, check your heart again. Or he's going to say, let's go ahead and fund it. But you got to treat God as the God that he is and begin to reverence him and saying, God, I'm not going to bring a request before you that's going to waste your time. God is not a God that wants his time wasted. I'm not saying you can't go to God about certain things. But check your heart before you check in with him. If you want the, a certain level of prayer, a certain level of God, check your heart before you check in with him. Any busy person, any successful person, <clears throat> they're going to get upset with you if you come empty handed. You don't call them, ask for 45 minutes of their time. You know what? I was supposed to be in L.A., but you know what? I, I'll take the next. And they they <clears throat> they um, inconvenience their schedule for you. And then you come with, well, I don't really got no questions. I just want to see how you're doing. I would be frustrated. Hey, I'm a, F, I'm a G list celebrity. So I'm way down the totem pole. But I, that would get on my nerves. We got to get to a place where we say, you know what, God? When I come to you, I'm going to come with facts. I'm going to come with everything. I'm going to come with the, the sincerity of my heart. Because God, I want this time to be valuable. God doesn't care about the quantity, he cares about the quality. And the quality of your time with God increases when you check your heart before you check in with him. That's just for certain matters. And if you're just going through a confusing time, you go seek your father because you are his son and daughter. But when it comes to certain things about things that he can control, don't waste God's time begging for something that only he can control. Because when he can control it, that means if it's in his control, it's in his timing. Oh, that's one area we don't like. <clears throat> God's timing. The more you begin to love God, the more you begin to understand his timing. I told the people in Miami, and I posted on my Facebook, I said, man, we gotta change our prayers 
from the question how long to the statement however long. How long says, I am not content with God because I'm asking the question. If you were a kid in the back seat <clears throat> going to Disney World, asking how long shows that you are more concerned or more interested in Disney World than the one driving. But when you're saying, you know what? I'm enjoying the ones driving, so it will take however long because I'm enjoying you. When God, when you say how long, you're telling God, I'm not enjoying you now. Asking the question how long is bringing discontentment. It's saying that I'm not content with God. However long says, God, you know what? It does sting a little. I do want it. But man, I want you even more. However long, God. When you pray that prayer, it shows even you that you're maturing that you're saying God I'm not going to bombard you with the 80% of my prayers being about the when the where and the how I just want to go into prayer time even if it's silent for 20 minutes even if it's worship for 20 minutes even if it's just sitting there writing in my journal I just want to enjoy your company when you do that he'll demonstrate like never before because now he knows he can trust you. If you still have idolatry in your heart, habitual sin in your heart, God cannot trust you. He loves you. His love is unlimited, but his trust with some is limited. Oh, that sounds horrible. What you mean, God, you don't trust me? God said, man, when you pray, you pray amiss to consume with your own lust. You want it, <clears throat> but you can't be trusted with it. If you want to show God that you're ready, you got to show him that you are a good steward of the season you're currently in. God is a God of decency and in order. If it ain't decent and if it ain't in order, he ain't going to move. That's why I tell people, don't ask God to order your steps if you ain't willing to go where he's ordering them. Don't ask God to just order my steps. God, lead and guide me into all truth. And you hit truth in the face. You're like, oh, this the truth? You led me to the truth? And God said, man, I'm always going to lead you to the truth of every matter. Let's keep going. <clears throat> Next point. Your, per your perception of forgiveness will, to a degree, determine your level of execution. We must never forget the weight of God's forgiveness. I mean, he did forgive us of murder. Your perception of forgiveness will, to a degree, determine your level of execution. We're talking about exercise and leading us to execution. Your perception of forgiveness will, to a degree, determine your level of execution. We must never forget the weight of God's forgiveness. I mean, he did forgive us of murder. Now, what does that mean? <clears throat> you think your porn addiction is the heaviest sin you ever did? You think the cheating was the heaviest sin you ever committed? You thought, you thought the lying and ruining families was the, was the heaviest sin you ever did. You thought, you know, you thought the thoughts that you even thought was the most wicked. No, he said, man, we're all guilty of murder. We're responsible for the death of Jesus himself. When you understand that, yo, when people, I love the text, the Pharisees was invited Jesus over. And, and, and you, the Pharisees was all about that, that notoriety. It was all about their name being in the lights. These Pharisees was like, you know, well, let's bring Jesus to the house. You know, if we bring him to the house, I may get about a couple of thousand more followers. And, and maybe if I bring Jesus over, maybe, you know, <clears throat> someone to take a picture. And then, you know, I may get some shine because the Bible even talked about that these Pharisees, they prayed on the front porch for their own glory. And Jesus said, that's their reward. Whatever reward they get from praying on the, on the, on the porch is the only reward they got. So back in the Bible days, when a Pharisee brought you over and you was of, of esteem and you was the AAA plus list celebrity, right, that Jesus was, they opened up the doors and windows. They opened up the doors and windows so they could have people come and see the conversation. So these Pharisees brought Jesus in and the doors were open. They didn't have chairs like they were sitting on the ground and they were sitting at tables at, at <clears throat> like that. And so, so these people were gathering around this Pharisee's house to just figure out what's the talk of the moment. They didn't have Twitter. They couldn't get their news. They didn't know what was going on in Syria. They didn't know what was going on. They had to come to this place to find out current news. This woman, the Bible says she was the woman of the city, meaning she was a prostitute. 
This woman said, oh, you got an open door? I'm going to come in. And this woman, she didn't ask, <clears throat> is my name on the list? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she, she ran in. She didn't say a word. All she knew was, the Bible doesn't give us any type of context that she and Jesus talked before. Maybe she was just in the audience going from one house to the other because they said that the alabaster flask, the oil that was in it was very expensive, meaning the ointment that she had was probably purchased from her services. And so when she came into the room, she broke it and she pulled her hair down <clears throat> and she began to wipe his feet with his tears. And, and the ointment was broken. That In certain texts, they said the Pharisee in his heart was a whole oh, if she knew how much that was. Man, we could have gave this to the poor. And, 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 and she just didn't care. And, and this Pharisee even began to ponder himself that if he was a prophet, he would knew what kind of woman was touching him. Because if you was a priest or a prophet, you didn't have unclean things touch you. That if someone who was unclean touched you, you got to go through all of these ceremonial <clears throat> uh, 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 rituals to become clean. That's how retarded they was back in the day. <laughs> Jesus even said, man, his disciples was like, yo, the, the Pharisees came to Jesus one time while he was eating his Bojangles and whatnot, and they was like, why your disciples eat with unwashed hands? And Jesus began like, it's not what goes in the mouth that defiles a person, it's what comes out of their heart that does. So let's get right back into the story. So when she began to wash his feet and Jesus, his God, divinity, divine self of his 100% man and 100% God essence, began to discern the heart of this Pharisee who was like, if he knew what kind of woman this was, he wouldn't let her touch him. Jesus looked at him, he said, this woman who was forgiven much, loves much. He began to tell a story about <clears throat> debtors, he was like, there was a man who owed a lot and was forgiven. But that same man who, was only, uh, who only had a small debt got rude with the person who had a larger debt towards him. <clears throat> and, 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 he, and he told a Pharisee, because Jesus was a smart man, he always answered a question with a question. And he began to ask the question, the Pharisee, the one that was forgiven the larger debt. And he began to say, because Jesus loved going into situations where a story can be told. He said, this woman whose sins are many, has been forgiven. The people who love much, or who have been forgiven much, love much. But those who have been forgiven, quote unquote, little, love little. Now, what is he saying? He said, it's your perception of forgiveness that will determine your execution. She was forgiven much that she was drawn in, that Jesus even said that as long as the earth remains, her story will be told. So significant because many people don't know that God used a prostitute to anoint him before burial. So God is saying, it doesn't matter what your past is, you never know how significant your future will be. And since she was forgiven of much, she loved much. So when I know for a fact that, oh, Mr. Goody Two, Golden Child, clean up Joshua Ezzy, who ain't really slapped nobody, ain't murdered nobody, who ain't did no sins, I don't get caught up in the sins I've committed in this life. I'm concerned about how still my sins today nailed him on the cross. So since I know that I was forgiven of murder, I can't help but love much. But when you just think, oh, my porn addiction, that's, that's small compared to a murderer. Oh, well, at least I ain't gay. At least I ain't this. So when you start comparing sins, God says, I don't measure sin differently. Every sin is equal. The consequences may be different, but in my eyes, sin is equal. That it doesn't matter if a baby was unborn, or a baby was born and died five days, that baby has a sin nature. Now, what I say about that, babies, I, I ain't going to get into that. But what I'm trying to say is, is that God can commence judgment at any time. That's why I'm so thankful that he chose me. But since I have been forgiven of murdering, not just you with words, or you with actions, but I physically was responsible. All of us in humanity were responsible for murdering God. The same person I murdered knocks on my door and says, you know what, I forgive you. When you know that and you appreciate that, you will love much. The process of our execution, we'll go through this real quickly so I can get to our 12 exercises. 
Our execution begins with the awareness of our emptiness. <clears throat> Once aware, our awareness will then lead us to an encounter with God. Once that encounter is made, that encounter will then begin to deepen our engagement with God. The more we begin to engage with God, the more we begin to build our endurance. And once our endurance is built, we will be ready to execute at a high level. I'm going to repeat that. <clears throat> I snuck those five E's in there. Mm -hmm. Snuck it in there on you. Mm -hmm. Our execution begins with an awareness of our emptiness. That when I am aware that I'm empty, it leads me to an encounter. Once that encounter is made with God, I, it will begin to deepen our engagement with God. The more we begin to engage with God, the more we begin to build our endurance. And once our endurance is built, we will be ready to execute at a high level. God is concerned about our execution. He doesn't care about just engagement. He cares about advancing the kingdom that he wants us to advance. He said, greater works you will do. That's why when I look at the Bible and I see people raising up people from the dead, that the same spirit that rose Christ of the dead dwells inside of me, that I actually have the power that, 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 that supersedes even Satan himself when I'm completely dependent. It's so sad that in this country we don't execute at that level. Is it because maybe that we're not aware that we're empty? My awareness of my emptiness, my depravity, my current condition leads me to an encounter with God. God only has an encounter with those who are aware that they're empty. Now, the beautiful thing about God I'm so appreciative is that he has toiled my heart before he planted the seed. Mark 4 talks about four different types of hearts. When the Bible talks about sowing into good ground, it wasn't talking about sowing into a church. They twist that scripture. What he was saying was, was that whatever kind of heart you have will determine the type of seed you receive. That there was hard hearts, and then there was hearts full of stone, and there was hearts full of thorns. Then there was a good heart, a heart full of good soil. Then the Bible says, when a heart is in a good ground, it will receive the seed, some bearing 30, some bearing 60, some bearing 100. God cares about birthing. Some of us only bring in 3%. God, through his spirit, wants to bring some 30 some 60, some 100 fold. God cares about returns on his investment, but the return I earn on his investment is predicated on the condition of our heart. That's why I'm thankful that God, before he planted the seed of salvation, before he planted certain seeds, he took my heart of stone, broke it down. He pulled the stones out, the thorns out, so that I can be ready to receive. The reason why many of us are not executing at a high level, our hearts are not ready. Why would God allow your heart to receive a vision, a dream, a business, let alone salvation, if your heart is still hard? How can he do it that if he, breathe, if he put a seed in a hard heart, that the, 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 uh, the bird will come and remove it, that deception will come and remove it, that if he plants a seed in a heart full of stone, that about time you received it with joy, but you had no endurance. And, or you could be a person who has thorns in their heart, but they allow the cares of this world to soak it in choke it away. That's why God's saying, let me prune you. We want prosperity over pruning. And the sad thing about it is the only time prosperity comes before pruning is in a dictionary. And when we understand it, we'll say, God prune me so that I can receive, so that I can bear fruit. Because I want to be a God. I want to make sure that God gets 100% back from his investment. But until I realize that I'm empty, and that I desperately need an encounter, a justifying moment by God. Jesus' ministry began when he was baptized and God said, that's my son of whom I'm well pleased. At that moment, he broadly told the people, this is the chosen one. Thank God that he can be the chosen one. Choosing me to succeed. But how can we succeed if we're not able to receive the seed? Until our heart is ready, we won't be ready. Emptiness, encounter, deepening our engagement, building our endurance. This is what the trainer does. He says, you know what? When you come to Salvation Fitness, there's a picture on the wall. 
And the picture on the wall is Jesus. And he says, the Bible says, the Spirit of God points us back to the Christ so that we'll know what's our market aim. For those who are driven, motivated, you have certain imagery before you that, that drives you towards it. I want to be like that. I want to be like this. We have different people that our hearts connect to because we want to be like that. And that's what the Holy Spirit is saying. The more we look at Jesus, the more we look at him, the more over time we'll be built like him. That's why God's saying, who is before you? Who are you trying to become? Because if you want to execute at a high level, you got to have endurance. Nothing you endeavor to do without endurance, you won't succeed. Listen, <clears throat> God doesn't train us to failure. He trains us to flourish. The good thing about it is when the resistance comes, it burns, but it's positioning me to flourish. God cares about character more so than platforms. If you seek a platform before you seek his presence, that platform will be too heavy, too bright for you. That's why God says you need to train first. Enjoy this off season. Enjoy this single season. Enjoy your marriage hidden. Enjoy the, 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 the world not knowing your name and your private sins. Enjoy this moment. Because so many people rush to a moment to only realize they're not strong enough to handle it. I got to make sure that I have the endurance that I need to succeed. Next point. The reason why many of us are not executing at a high level <clears throat> is due to us not being consistent in exercising in the things of God. The reason why many of us are not executing at a high level is due to us not being consistent in exercising the things of God. Just like we cannot out-exercise a poor diet, we cannot out-express a poor devotion. Just like we cannot out-exercise a poor diet, we cannot out-express a poor devotion. Meaning, <clears throat> you can eat bad all day long and go to the gym more than you eat bad you still won't have the right results. People try to out-express a poor devotion. They're online out-expressing that I'm gonna express that I have this relationship, but they really don't. That's why I'm thankful that people don't have access to audit or us. Because they truly followed us home after the hands was raised, after you, I'm tubby tubby wondering why people go to the altar, the same person goes to the altar every Sunday. Falling out every week. I'm like, are you tired of hitting the floor? Are you tired of the death grip that they be giving you in the altar? Aren't you, how many times you gotta be delivered before you deliver? Like how many times are you gonna be willing to be free? Man, we got, <clears throat> but, they, but they express this relationship with God that's not evident. And people's trying to express a poor relationship. You may fool 99.9% .9 of the people, but you can't fool the people who actually do. You can fool the people on your level, but you can't fool them super saints. Them saints who's been with God, that's why I tell people you can't be seasoned without seasons. So you can't fool seasoned believers because they've been through some seasons. They done seen your kind before. They seasoned, they lowry seasoned, they, they, they salty, they, 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 they can preserve you for a long time. They, they, they increase blood pressure. Oh, I'm about to preach now. That, that, that they're so salty that the pressure of the blood, uh-huh, will saturate the hearts and minds. Hey, Shondo. But what I'm trying to say is, is that we got to get to a place where we stay salty <laughs> because the more salty we are, the more seasoned we are, the longer we last. I tell people all the time, God says in order for you to be seasoned, you got seasons to go through. Oh, talk to them old saints who don't been around two world wars. Them saints who seen some things, drunk out of the colored water fountains. Talk to them saints who's been through tough times. Talk to those marriages that's been together for 50, 60, 70 years. Talk to them, they'll tell you on what sees in them. And when you interview those people, they always say it was because of the grace of God. Us, we got more accessories to go with the grace of God. So instead of the grace keeping us, we let everything else to keep us. When God's like, look, you can't be kept by everything else. Only I can keep you. That's why I need God now before I get married. 
I need God now before I have kids. I need God now before they, before a video go viral. I need God before the world knows my name because if I don't have him now and the lights are on me immediately, I won't handle the pressure well. That's why God's saying I won't season people. That's why I don't envy people who you assume were promoted by God. Just because they got 100,000 followers don't mean that God got them those followers. Don't, don't look at your followers and be like, well, why my ministry not popping? I used to go through that. But God said, man, you got my power, though. You don't know what they got. They don't seek me. They don't follow me. They don't care about me. The devil knows how to get you likes. When people were promoted overnight with no 10-year gap, I have a 10-year night overnight rise. And people's like, man, Josh, you popping. No, I've been popping since 08, 07 when I accepted the call I've been popping but you got to be popping when no one's watching because when you're strifting while no one's watching you don't get caught up in the hype why get caught up in the hype girls who money who where you gonna take me you won't take me to heaven no you can't so you don't you're not the conductor of the train that's gonna take me to glory you are not that person so I got to be content in the one who put me here that's a challenge and a charge for everyone who's trying to go to the top because you got two kingdoms that's pushing people to the top. And a lot of people have been pushed to the top knowingly or unknowingly by Satan himself and his king. That's why I say, man, do not get so caught up on who was promoted because the devil promotes quicker than God does. God promotes based upon character. The devil promotes based upon what he wants. He knows they're not ready. That's why I tell people, <clears throat> you got to know you before you accept anything that's presented before you. Because when you know you, you can tell good things no. It is not the bad things that trips believers. It's the good things that do. There's a difference between bad, good, and God. Bad things, we're not really trying to be immoral because we actually, we have an image to <laughs> uphold. <laughs> we're trying to be those, those sanctified Christians, right? So we ain't going to be out there in the, in the, in the, in the, doing all this crazy stuff. But man, it's the good opportunities. And God said, you got to have enough trust in me to distinguish between the good and the God. I didn't even get to my 12 exercises. We should call this message something else. <laughs> Just like we cannot out-exercise a poor diet, we cannot out-exercise a poor devotion. How consistent are you? Are you truly devoted? For 10 minutes, real quick, we're going to go through these 12 exercises. 15 minutes. <clears throat> Number one, except like I did three or four of these last week. We're going to go over them real quick. These are 12 exercises to help us keep in step with the Spirit and help us avoid habitual sins. Number one, accept adoption and determine your full devotion. In order for us to keep in step with the Spirit of God and avoid habitual sin, we have to accept that we were adopted by God. Many of us don't like the term adoption because that means I was brought from a lesser place. When you, people don't adopt rich, privileged kids, they adopt kids in tough situations, at least the bulk of adoption does. So when you know that you've been adopted, you gotta have a certain level of appreciation. God says that I wasn't your firstborn, that since now I, you have brought me to be a joint heir even with Christ, that's humbling. That in order for me to keep in step with the Spirit of God, I have to always accept that I was adopted graciously by God. And then I must determine my full, not partial, devotion. Have you truly decided to be fully devoted? People, listen, decision means incision. It means to cut, it means to cut something off and go forward. <clears throat> a man has not truly decided on a woman if he has two women. A man hasn't truly decided on a woman, hold on, you know what I'm trying to say, that you gotta have a full devotion. You can't have two and say that you devoted. So you gotta choose between God or the world. And right now, you gotta choose whether you're gonna be hot or cold. If you're gonna be hot, Wear clothes accordingly. Live according to the temperature that you're living in. How You can't bring a sweater to South Beach and expect to be successful. Many of us still bringing old sins to cover us in hot temperatures and we wonder why we can't last. Number two, you got to maintain devotion through disciplines. You just can't articulate a devotion that you have. You got to set up disciplines to ensure you stay dedicated to those devotions. If you do not have disciplines, you're going to fall off. Number three, 
you got to forgive yourself and others quickly. Not only do you need to accept and maintain, but you got to forgive yourself and others quickly. The Bible says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Many of us have allowed 50, 60, 70 days to go by before we even think about forgiving. And when you do that, you set yourself up and other people up to fall. That's why even if I'm wrong, I'd rather lose the battle and win the war than to try to be undefeated. When people try to be undefeated, I ain't forgiven because that's less, that's, that's, that's beneath me. Mm -mm. You do something wrong to me, yo, I forgive you. Did I, did I offend you? You're trying to figure things out before the sun goes down because the more days you let go by, the more you give the devil opportunity. Number four, <clears throat> develop support systems. In order to be successful, you got to surround yourself with strong support systems. You cannot surround yourself with dull people. You got to surround yourself with sharp people. Dull knives, the only thing you can cut through is butter. You need sharp people to help you navigate in life. You got to develop support systems for yourself spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, community, the right church. Everything matters because the right support system will keep you supported. God don't care about how dope your shingles look, how, how the French doors you have, French doors, the doors that you be wanting, the crown molding, he cares about the foundation. Right. He cares about <clears throat> have you been supported and have you been founded. Number five, you gotta remove all people and items that pose a threat to your devotion. You gotta, I don't care, listen you, you, listen, you are the assistant coach to your team and God's the coach of your team. You gotta say, who we cutting? I'm not afraid to make cuts anymore because I got somewhere to go. Listen, if you got a poor player in your team, you got to switch. You got to cut people off your team. You got to complain and whine like LeBron at times and be like, I need more help. Develop support systems. Number five. Oh, I'm sorry. Remove all people and items that pose a threat to your devotion. Anything and anyone that poses a threat to you and God, you got to cut off. The Bible says if your right eye or right hand offends you, cut it off. That doesn't mean, when I was a kid, I'm like, dang, God's a savage. But then my mom had to teach me in my elementary stage. She said, baby, it don't mean cut your eye out or your hand. It's a metaphor, it's a figure of speech. I said, well, thank God, because I'm about to grab a knife, because it's eye. I'm about to be like, mama, I'm like this, mama. Mama, I'm good. <laughs> but what that means is, if it's interfering with you and God, cut it off immediately. And number six, don't apologize for your new or sustained devotion. You don't got to apologize to nobody. You got a hell to put me in? Oh, you don't? Okay, keep it moving. I'm not gonna apologize if I gotta cut you off because I got somewhere to go. And right now, your, your scouting report says leech, 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 leech. And right now, you're hindering me from progressing. Number seven, create a culture of honesty with yourself, God, and trusted accountability. If you want to succeed, you gotta create a culture of honesty. I mean, you gotta go to God and be honest with yourself, number one. <clears throat> It's hard to be honest with God if you're not honest with yourself. You gotta say, you know what? I ain't that dope. I be looking at myself sometimes like, man, sometimes you be feeling yourself, oh, I'm dope. God, you heard them five E's, God, I dropped that thing. God, yeah, God, I dropped that thing. God, that thing was dope. God be like, you still not dope. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit was dope at that time. I used you. <laughs> and I, that's, that's why being in ministry is so depressing because you're being used 99.9% .9 of the time. And that's why you got to be okay with being a vessel. You can't, you can't be so consumed with being number one. You got to be consumed with, you know what, God? Use me, get the glory. I used to be that dude, like, man, I'm dope, I'm nice. God said, man, do not come with dope words and phrases. Come with my power. Words they'll remember for two or three weeks. But if they felt me through you, that residue can last for months. You got to create a culture of honesty with yourself. You got to be real with you. Look in that mirror and be like what Michael Jackson says. I got to start with the man in the mirror and tell that joker to change his ways. And when you're honest with yourself, you can then be honest with God. And I, like I put it, trusted authority. You can't just be confessing your sins to everybody. You got you to gotta confess your sins with people who are volts and not vultures. Because when you got vultures, they smell in blood. Oh, 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 she got something, she's gonna tell me something, I need, I need to tell somebody this. You gotta say, you know what God, surround me with the right people that I won't even hear my sins in the streets. Trusted authority. Number eight, observe sin correctly. <clears throat> in order to be successful, you have to observe sin correctly. You gotta look at every sin as, as evil as it is. So when you made your devotion, and you found out this new girl on Pornhub is out. 
you got to say, you know what? This thing is dangerous. You see something that even parallels to your old ways and old habits, whether it's coming shopping, gluttony, whatever it is, you got to say, you know what? I see the sin for what it really is. It is a danger to everything. Sin, when, you, when it separates you from God, you lose. You have to observe. If you want to win and exercise and be strengthened, you got to observe sin correctly. Number nine, never, get, never forget that it's impossible to fight sin in your own might. It's impossible. You can have 40 different disciplines, 50 support systems, but if you try to do it in your might, you're not going to win. Every morning you got to say, God, I'm dependent on you. God, I need you like never before. People be like, man, you be traveling and stuff. Like, no, listen, <clears throat> I need God. Nope. If you boast about being faithful, if you boast about being dope as a Christian, if you boasting, you, you unfocused. If you boasting, you're not focused. A person that boasts is saying, hey, I'm good. The devil's like, oh, he's ready to be, he's ready to be tripped up. Oh, she's talking too much right now. If you can see him before, if you can hear him before you see him, don't trust him. If people can't see the fruit, but all they hear is your fruit, chances are you have no fruit. Number 10, utilize your spiritual resources often. Utilize your spiritual resources often. Your praying, your fasting. You got to develop a system. The Holy Spirit is going to be like, here's a regimen. Do this. <clears throat> utilize it as often as possible. Utilize your spiritual resources often. Number 11, stay low key. Just chill, man. The more people see and the more people know. You ever seen that meme that said, uh, uh, what did it say about when, they, when a person breaks up? And it was like, why you ain't tell, tell us what happened? You told us your relationship from the beginning. So why y'all break up? Because we introduce people. The reason why things get separated because we allow too many eyes and too many people in it. That's why in order to succeed, stay low key. Be mysterious. If people know all about you, they can use you against you. That's why people think they know me. They don't know me. I got ideas. I ain't tell nobody. I'm low key. I got, listen, listen. When you tell people everything, man, you don't know what that person will do. Man, I stay low key, man. I am transparent, but I'm transparent, but, um, Selective transparency. huh? What do you say? Selective. Selective transparency. Oh, I'll be pulling out my heart in the message, but you ain't gonna know what's really going on in my life. Number 12, stay productive on your purpose. Stay productive on your purpose. Ask your boy Noah. Them people's like, man, bro, it ain't gonna rain. He stayed productive. 90 some years, was it 60 some years? My man was building art for 60 years? It was a long time. Joker was out there building, they, them people came up every day like, man, this fool, until that one raindrop hit one of them in the forehead. And Noah was like this, <laughs> door closed. <laughs> Suckers. <laughs> Stay productive on your purpose and don't care what other people say. My final thoughts, we get you out of here. We show an appreciation of God's investment by increasing our stock. What are you doing now to ensure that God gets a return on his investment in your life? We show an appreciation of God's investment by increasing our stock. What are you doing now to ensure that God gets a return on his investment in your life? We are so far from perfection that there is always room for us to improve. In other words, there is no room for stagnation. Always room to improve. Always areas to grow in your life. If you don't appreciate what God did for you and the fitness that he wants to bring you through to give you the opportunity to work out your salvation, you will miss out on the opportunity of being great. I'm not saying everybody's going to be world-renowned great, but you can be a great mom, a great father, a greater son, a great businessman, woman. You can be great, but not in your own strength. We need to work out our own salvation with reverence and dependency. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time. Bless these great men and women. And I pray right now, Father God, that we'll have a better understanding of our responsibility in sanctification. Thank you, Lord, for sanctifying our souls, keeping us, sustaining us. But more than that, God, we thank you, Father God, for your son and the, 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 the objectives of the co-founders of salvation. We thank you, Father God, that you'll continue to lead us and guide us to all truth that we'll be able to grow daily. Daily we're supposed to grow, not just yearly, but every day we have an opportunity to improve. And we thank you for your time, God. We love you. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. Let's go ahead and get into some groups. I got